Today we have Dr. Gil Morgan, the founder of uh, Onco Alert, who's in Sweden. Thanks for joining us today, Gil. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much. Uh, always an honor. Thank you for the invite. Great. Can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and your medical background? Absolutely. Uh, I'm actually, I'm a clinical oncologist. Uh, I am originally from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I currently work in Southern Sweden. Uh, I started the, the first part of my career in molecular biology and uh, well, molecular and developmental biology. And that was before transitioning into medicine and eventually oncology. Uh, my biggest interest I would say would be professionally are in the fields of cancer prevention and global policy. Okay, cool. And why did you decide to pursue a career in medicine and particularly oncology? What was your motivation there? Mm -hmm. well, not to be cliche, but I, I do come from a medical family, which just puts a stethoscope in my hand at a very early age. However, oncology has had a personal place in my heart, having lost a friend at an early age. Uh, and this initially directed me to, towards cancer research and eventually mm -hmm. into oncology. Now, I honestly could not think of doing anything else as I feel that this is definitely my life's calling and this is where I am needed and where I can do the most good. Uh, so it's definitely a great reason to wake up every day besides my family and serve the people that I know need it in the best way I know how. Wow, that's amazing. Um, um, you're obviously, Gil, you know, I know you studied in San Antonio. What motivated you to move from the US to Sweden? Well, I, I actually, I, I went from overall, I mean, I studied in, in Texas, I studied in Boston, I did my fellowship in Washington, I came back to Texas. Uh, so, so I've been moving around ever since I was 18. But the whole move to Sweden originally was not a permanent one. Uh, a good friend of mine had actually married a Swede. And in mm -hmm. chatting about medical systems, he actually invited to come check it out. So having been someone all my life looking for adventure and travel, Sweden seemed like a great choice. And now a decade later, I feel like I've actually incorporated Sweden as much as I incorporated the U.S. So my life is here, my family is here, and of course my patients are here. So I, I'm very happy. Well, well, did you have to do all the medical boards in Sweden? Did you have to do? I, I did, I did. I, I had to, to have uh, my, my training here and the exams here, but it was, it was okay. It, it, Everybody wonders about the language, and the language is actually quite uh, similar to, to English, and everybody here is uh, very, um, very good at speaking English, so it was, it was definitely something that didn't take that long to, to come in. Oh, so you, you practice in Swedish every day? You, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Oh, from, very good. From the morning yeah. until, <laughs> until right now. Wow, that's, that's, that's impressive. And what have you noticed the differences in, in practice between the U.S. and Sweden? I actually think the differences in practicing, clinically speaking, are actually very few. There are great standards in both countries, and we do our best to keep them up. However, what I think is the biggest difference overall is on the impact the patients have. Being part of a social health care system, there is uh, no health insurance to worry about, no co-pays. Uh, not having to think about my patients and how they're going to actually pay for the treatment, it just simply takes off a big load off my back. And I just mm. have to concentrate on the actual oncology side, on treating. And, and that makes me sleep like a baby because mm. it is such a wonderful thing not having to worry. I think I, I see it as a luxury, not having to, to think about how my uh, patients are going to have to pay for these treatments. And when we see something, when we see a specific tumor, or you know, when we think of a specific treatment, we don't think of, well, how, what is this costing? How is the mm. patient gonna pay for it? We just recommend it and it's given. And I, I think that that is the biggest luxury any doctor can have. I bet, yeah, I bet. And it, it, are most of the same uh, drugs approved in Sweden as there in, in the US or anywhere else yeah, in the world? The majority, the majority yeah. are. Uh, and, and if not, as you know, we have the, the FDA and the, M, uh, the EMA are, uh, they don't necessarily come out at the same time and it might take some months. But mm. for the most part, uh, I think it, it, we, we all use the same drugs. And oftentimes it's a basis of uh, the, the actual, what that country can afford uh, in Sweden, I, I must say, really invests in that. So it feels really good to to be able to to be able to to provide or at least recommend uh, these drugs as if I would if I was in the U.S. 
Well, that's great. That's brilliant. And uh, just to speak a little bit about Onco Alert, um, you know, do you want to give a brief introduction to Onco Alert and then tell us a little bit about what led you to start it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Onco Alert is actually a network of. Uh, Originally started off as a network of oncologists, uh, and it started off with 15 on oncologists, and, and these were uh, friends of mine. These are friends that I had through social media that I knew were inverse in social media. I had to start it maybe a year or two beforehand, uh, and what uh, I, I wanted to do is I just wanted to have a, a, a little network that was going to be able to, to promote oncology. What OncoAlert has evolved into now is a faculty of over 150 uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgical oncologists, uh, patient advocates, uh, oncology nurses, and cancer scientists. Even uh, you got a couple of pathologists in there. Uh, and what we do is, I mean, we, we always say we, yeah, we're fighting cancer through social media, which sounds very cliche, but what we're doing is we're promoting oncology information. We're making sure that we're amplifying and that we're reaching, we're making this information reach as far as possible. Now, on top of that, we actually have uh, new mandates. Whereas in the beginning, we were thinking about just the education. Now we're thinking about the amplification of uh, the voices of our patient advocates, mm -hmm. uh, helping fight racial inequities, which is something that uh, the pandemic has definitely highlighted and uh, we, we definitely believe in it and, and, we, and it's something that we need to be proactive about. And of course, highlighting and helping erase global disparities. Now, when I say global disparities, this can be from um, our colleagues in low and middle income countries that maybe do not have the same resources that we do as oncologists and even in their training. And then to the point of uh, being in these low and middle income countries, the resources that they have and the availability they have for these drugs. So those are mandates that we have adopted over time. And it's something that OncoAlert continues to strive for. Uh, and we do this by um, taking collaborations with different society, coming up with uh, new, um, new initiatives that will help us get there. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a group effort. Uh, I know oftentimes people just see my face but quite honestly, those 150 faculty members are, are Uncle Alert, and Uncle Alert would not be anything if it weren't for our colleagues worldwide that actually support us and engage with us daily. Uh, so I, I think they're the reason that Uncle Alert exists. Okay, great. And how did you find those colleagues that you collaborate with? Where, where you know, is it organic or? Uh, well, the, these are all my friends. They, they're my mm -hmm. friends in social media. And, and it's funny, I, I was uh, giving a presentation yesterday and, and telling people, it's just like, well, these, these are actually real connections that you're making in social media, because mm -hmm. you have to realize that you're speaking to some of these people more than you, your own family. So naturally, you're going to have some relationship develop. Uh, the people I interact with, I interact daily. So I know that if I invite someone to the network, I know that they're a good fit. Obviously, if I'm going to invite them, I, know, I must know them very well because I, I have to make sure that this is, this is a person that is going to, you know, if, if they're going to say this person is, if we're going to say this person is on goal alert, then we have to trust things that that person normally says. Now that that doesn't really come overnight. It doesn't. I don't go on instinct. Uh, normally, there is a procedure. I in, in order to invite new faculty, uh, their account is actually followed uh, two to three months to make sure that their materials uh, that they're promoting, the voice that they're putting out, their interaction with patients and colleagues are is along the lines of onco alert. And of course, there are values. We need their value to be right in line. If we are a network that is very uh, based on our values, we have to make sure that the people that we invite to form part of our faculty have those same values. And, and it has happened where you know I, I, I start and then of course I, I don't follow through because I don't feel that person or persons would be a good fit for the network. Uh, and, and the reason I do that is not because I, I want to be exclusive, it's the opposite. I wanna be as inclusive as possible but mm. I do have to worry about what we believe in and the people that are coming in, if they're going to represent the network, they have to believe in the same thing. And, and our beliefs are 
our not strength is really focus on our patients, make sure that we're amplifying mm. them and making sure that we want to do, we want to help others and not just put the focus on ourselves. So that is the main thing with Onco Alert is that we are not trying to highlight ourselves. We want to make sure that we give the rest of our colleagues worldwide a reason to, uh, or a, a, a way to highlight any research that they think is actually uh, needs to be highlighted, that, that needs to be, um, needs to be shared uh, with the rest of our colleagues worldwide. Okay, great, brilliant. And what do you think the secret of its, of its success is? It's done so well, you know, it's, it's 10,000 <laughs> followers more. Yeah, it, well, you know, uh, I, I think the secret is that there is no secret. <laughs> Is that we? It's like I said in the beginning. We're, we're all on alert, and like I, the first thing I do in any sort of interview or presentation is give a shout out to all of our colleagues out there that actually engage with us because this happens because of them. We're doing it for them. Uh, we mm-hmm. are colleagues. None of this get you know. This is this is not uh, an, an actual uh, institution or a charity or a nonprofit. We're just colleagues that are coming up with this. Uh, I, I take the time to, to form it, to get the contact, but all, all of it is coming from other places. I just kind of put it together, make sure that it's along the valleys of Uncle Lord, to make sure that it is exactly uh, something that we promote. And if it's coming through our account, okay, perfect. And the great thing is that I know that our faculty is always on the lookout. And I, I've, had, uh, I've had one or two uh, tweets kind of slip on by that I... Uh, Re, uh, retweet it from the on alert account and our faculty will tw- uh, send me a message saying have, have you looked at this uh, check the article and uh, you know, may- maybe this is a little strange and of course I, I can't be an expert on everything I count on mm-hmm. that faculty who's an amazing faculty I mean uh, it's it's such a luxury to have some of the best people in every specific group and, and they just let me know it's like I, I don't think I think we should retract this and I take it away it, it has happened once or twice uh, it doesn't happen very often but I think that's the beauty of it is I have the luxury of having our colleagues provide that kind of content and at the same time I have an amazing faculty that is always watching for the interest of Uncle Alert and making sure that whatever we say is something that our colleagues worldwide can actually trust so I, mm-hmm. I think that that's a really great thing uh, and because of this dynamic, it just gives you that engagement. And that's the cool thing about Uncle Alert is that anybody can engage with, with us. It's, and, and it's, this isn't something private. This isn't something that you have to belong to. If, if you're using the hashtag, if you're, if you're including us in the conversation, we will jump in. We will chime in. Uh, and I don't think, I haven't seen, as a colleague, I haven't seen anything like that. I, I don't want to be. Uh, of course, everyone's a little biased, but I just had not seen it. And I guess that that's the reason that, that we started is because that wasn't there. Who's benefited most from Onco Alert? Uh, we know that your aim is to reach oncology professionals outside of the US and Sweden um, and help them by providing you know, thought leadership uh, on certain topics. Is that, is that what you've achieved or is, is it kind of gone a different direction from what you originally set out? I think we're still there. Uh, mm. I think we're constantly trying to spread this so that all stakeholders benefit, but we want to be able to make a difference with those that are in low and middle income countries and don't have the same resources at the rest. So, so we really want to make sure that uh, we, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that, that, that we're there to, to stand up for, for others because people can't stand up on themselves but we definitely want to be able to amplify Like for example, our patient advocates are such a, an amazing patient advocates community within Twitter and they have a voice. All, the only thing we're doing is we don't wanna, I definitely don't wanna replace their voice. I don't want it to be like, well, the doctors now get to, to say the same thing. It's like, no, I want to just give them the megaphone. I want us to be that megaphone and to mm. share their views, to share their goals, to share their needs, especially their needs because that is what we have to listen to as doctors. Uh, and I, I really think that, that we, can, we can gain a lot by listening to that voice. And of course, with our colleagues in low and middle income countries, they need help. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think uh, when it came down to Onco Alert and getting into education and using that amazing faculty, which I abuse uh, my friendship with the faculty so much in getting educational material, but it's for a good cause. It's because we actually are creating stuff 
that is going to benefit uh, our colleagues in, in, in these countries. Uh, we actually came up with, a, with an initiative that is actually ongoing right now. Uh, and we are uh, teaming up with uh, national uh, oncology societies in low and middle income countries. And they're, it's under the umbrella of OncoAlert. And they're the ones that are actually helping us in establishing some of our educational content for the OncoAlert colloquium. Because everybody knows that these specific countries have different needs than in the rest. It's not the same as in the US or in Sweden. Uh, they, they are having a different way of practicing and it needs to be addressed. And one, that's one of the things that I kept on hearing is it's like, well, it's great if you're in this country, but not where I'm practicing. And that was resonating. So what we did is we are taking that voice and giving it to our faculty so that our faculty knows that this is what we need to focus on because this is what is needed in that specific region, instead of just forgetting about those problems and just continuing with a normal lecture that we normally would have on these novel therapies, but also coming back to you know, the, the things that can actually be useful to our colleagues in, in these countries. So okay. I, I think it, it's, a, it's a really cool way of, of helping uh, a lot of people that, that can definitely help themselves but of course, everybody can use a, a little helping hand every once in a while. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Sure, great. Could, could you give me an example of, um, you know, one of the types of projects you've done for uh, lower middle in income company, countries, um, if possible, just, just out of curiosity. Well, th this is, this is what the one that we have. Right, right now it's focusing on, on education. Uh, and, and that is uh, having a representative from, um, uh, one of these uh, national um, national societies. Uh, yeah, I'll, we'll come out with the the official. We haven't come out with the actual project there out in the open because I've been recruiting the actual societies that are working, and there is actually one uh, bigger European society. Uh, it was of a European oncology uh, society in a specific country that is helping us as far as a, a mentorship role. And then we're mm. having other small low, uh, societies from low and middle income countries. Uh, the majority right now are, are in Asia. Uh, what they're doing is that we're getting together, we're coming, coming up with kind of a think tank on each specific uh, tumor group as far as what kind of uh, material is needed for educational material that is needed that could be incorporated into our ongoing third colloquium. Now, mm. you're starting small. I, I, I like always thinking small, and then if something works, you can expand on that. So we're doing it on our colloquium because it's ours. So we, I don't, we don't have to ask permission. Uh, and it's, it's actually, it's an end of the year wrap up. So I think it's a perfect opportunity. What I'm hoping we'll, we'll accomplish is by establish this think tank, uh, this uh, global equity uh, consortium, then we're going to be able to allow other, uh, whether it be uh, institutions or societies, if they can, if they want to request, the, if they want to talk to, to, to this consortium, then they can chime in and as a group, give their view on what is needed for that specific country so that they, that region is not forgotten in terms of the, the kind of the educational needs that they have. Mm. So, so this is something that we're, um, we're starting off for the colloquium, but of course, I, this is not meant to be a selfish thing so that Uncle Lord can benefit by having somebody who gives us tips on the colloquium, but really more of so, uh, unifying these um, names national oncology uh, uh, societies in these low and middle income countries so that they can start forming that think tank. Of course, it's under the umbrella of Uncle Alert because it, we, we have to have something uh, being the umbrella. Uh, and then after that, it's something where if they want to go ahead and uh, consult uh, or uh, be con uh, form a consulting consortium for, for other societies or institutions, and then what I was hoping for is that it would be something that they would start collaborating with each other and be able to either do research, uh, to, to uh, put in uh, for papers, uh, abstracts, just come up with their own projects so that it, it would just be a, a, a nice way to, um, to collaborate, uh, which is something that, that I've seen with Encore within, uh, within our own network 
uh, within our, our junior faculty uh, that they've, they've gotten together and they come up with projects and then we get some of our, our senior faculty to chime in and all of a sudden you have this perfect uh, mentor-mentee relationship and then mm. Encolor does its best to power it and then we're able to submit something for uh, whether it be for uh, uh, an annual Congress or for publication. So I, I think having seen that, I, I think it's very possible. Uh, and, and quite honestly, sometimes in these low and middle income countries, those opportunities are not very, yeah, they're, they're not very often. Uh, mm. And if we could provide that, if we can provide some opportunities for them, uh, I think it would be cool. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like a really, really, really cool initiative. Um, so why do you focus more on Twitter than other social media platforms? Well, we are actually on other platforms. Uh, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, we're in LinkedIn, we're on YouTube. But of course, uh, you have to remember Uncle Alert is, uh, is just a, a, a group of colleagues. There is no staff, there is no Uncle Alert. Uncle Alert headquarters is my apartment. So it just means that we have to put our efforts in the platforms where we have the most people. And it just so happens that right now, Twitter is the one where we have the, the most people. We are a niche network because we have, I think right now we're at 17,500 or 600 people. Uh, but the majority of those are people working in cancer care. But the majority of those are actually medical oncologists uh, followed by clinical oncologists and radiation oncologists, but we also have some patient advocates, uh, some oncology nurses, some researchers. Uh, but I think that is the beauty of it is that we are very specific in who our followers are. Of course, we can't control who follows us, and it's great. Uh, but I, I, when I, I, I have every once in a while, I look back and I see who's there, and it's mostly uh, stakeholders, and I think that's what we want. So if we're if you're going to because we are very a very bare bones operation. Uh, we have to make sure that whatever we're invest, investing our time in is what is going to work. And right now, uh, because of the sheer numbers that we have, uh, it's Twitter, I think uh, Facebook, we have maybe 5,000, Instagram, we have 4,500, and uh, LinkedIn, uh, we've been kind of late to the game with LinkedIn, I, I started, few months ago and I think we're like uh, Uncle Lert is 500 and same thing with our YouTube channel uh, so we try to get it out there we try to get that information as, 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 as often as we can but of course with our with our own limitations being that that we are uh, a network by colleagues uh, that have normal clinics like I just finished uh, it, it's just it just means that we have to wait until uh, until we're done with work to get back to this work which we're doing gladly. We, I think it's a lot of fun, uh, mm. but it does impede, uh, impede us from actually being able to have more of a presence in these other networks. Yeah, of course, of course. Should I say platforms? Um, sorry? Should I say platforms? <laughs> the platforms, yeah. yeah. Um, so Uncle Art has been there before the pandemic. What, what kind of change, changes did you see during the pandemic and you know, now after the pandemic, or if we want to call it after the pandemic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's incredibly ambitious to say after the pandemic. Yeah. I think we're, we're still smack dab in the middle of it. But mm -hmm. I, I think uh, the pandemic didn't really do much. Uh, if anything, because uh, everybody asked me the same thing, because for some reason, everybody thinks that after the pandemic, that's what made Uncle Alert stand out. It's actually the opposite. We were actually growing a lot faster before the pandemic, because after the pandemic or during the pandemic, People were flocking to social media and everybody was putting a lot of money into social media. So there was these really great presentations and that's what you're competing with. You're competing for, for that attention. Mm. Uh, fortunately for us, we, this is not, you know, we're not really competing for it. We just want the information out there. So mm. we, were, we were all kind of doing the same thing. Uh, and, and that's the great thing is that we kept at our core and we kept on focusing on, on those values that we had. And of course, developing, adopting new values as we went along. Um, and I actually think that the one thing that uh, we were able to do is to learn the importance of flexibility, mm -hmm. to learn that you, know, you can't be rigid. You can't just say, well, I'm gonna do this and this is how I'm going to do it. 
you have to listen to the people and you have to listen to what they need. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but like in March of last year, we have the Onco Alert uh, Roundtable. The first one we had, which was mm -hmm. uh, with our colleagues from Italy. And I think mm -hmm. that one had like 23,000 views within 24 hours, which is amazing. I mean, we, we've never had anything like that uh, afterwards, uh, but that's because we were answering, um, we're, we're answering the call for information because that's what our, our colleagues needed worldwide. Nobody knew anything about this. Everybody knew that they had to prepare, but they didn't know how. And here mm -hmm. we had people that were probably three to four weeks ahead of us, and they could give us some tips into how to brace ourselves and how to actually help uh, help for all, for those that that work in in uh, in healthcare, how to how to help uh, and how to better organize ourselves, how to bring that information into our systems and talk to our colleagues so that we were able to incorporate it. And that had to do with that flexibility. And I mm -hmm. think yeah, because of that flexibility and that in, uh, ability to just adapt to these uh, round tables, uh, it uh, really gave us uh, credibility. And that mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of people start, uh, it didn't make them, uh, but it uh, allowed for a lot of people to start trusting us and, and they knew that, okay, well, they're, they're doing this uh, out of, um, as a reactionary measure. Uh, mm. for, for something that is happening at the moment. Uh, we have that same thing. That's a great thing uh, about OncoAlert is that cancer develops uh, or cancer treatments develop almost daily. And there's always something new in, in cancer news. So we feel that you have, to, you have to be there. You have to be very reactionary with the cancer news that come out because you have to be able to spread them out just as soon as they come out. Of course, everything that is peer reviewed and, and not just, you know, wild flames, but the, the peer review information that is coming down, we have to be able to go out there and share it with, with our colleagues worldwide. And I think this is the perfect platform for it. Mm, definitely. Um, and what does the future look like for Anko Alert? Well, uh, inclusion. Uh, we need to continue focusing on bringing more colleagues, uh, but also keep representing our colleagues from low and middle income countries. And of course, uh, amplifying that voice of our our patient advocates, but I want to make sure that uh, we have more of a presence by oncology nurses, that we incorporate more. I think we have one surgical oncologist. So I need more surgical oncologists to be formed part of OncoAlert, but in order for that, I need to be a little more savvy about surgical oncology and start getting in there and see, okay, what is important to, 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 this, to this group. Uh, my dream of, with OncoAlert in its development, it's having a, a flat structure. Uh, being in Sweden now for almost a decade, we're a very big fan of the flat structure. Uh, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a nurse's assistant, everybody has the same say. Uh, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody has a, a better job or a more important job. You just have a different job. So you all listen to each other for the benefit of the patient. So it's the mm -hmm. exact same thing that I wanna be able to do here, but with a sort of open dialogue to be able to have our patient advocates our uh, oncology nurses, our medical oncologists, be in that same conversation, be able to have this dialogue and to be able to share this information uh, without actually having to thinking, uh, to, without having to think of, you know, what does this person do for a living? What is this person's title? Uh, just being as inclusive as, as we possibly could. Um, mm. I think that would make me, make me the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> Great, brilliant. The fact that new drugs are coming out, I mean, not daily, but at least every week, uh, and new targets, uh, new techniques that we're using, whether it be liquid biopsies uh, or CRISPR, uh, it's, it's just, it's exciting, it's cool. And, and if you're a, a, a geeky nerd like me, you just think this is like the business. So I, if, if I had to boil it down to one thing, I think we're living in the decade of targeted therapies. So I think this is the one thing that is just going to explode in the next two years. Uh, so I, I'm just bracing myself uh, because I mean, we have all these targets that are just, I mean, because of the wonderful technology that, that is coming out, we're just uh, finding all these targets. Now I, I can just imagine what it's going to be like finding drugs uh, to actually treat these targets. Uh, it, it's going to be amazing. So I have a lot of hope for this uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll get there and it will, it will, it will make a big difference, hopefully, for, for, for the people that are actually 
uh, affected with with cancer. Yes. What about CRISPR? I know a lot of people have a a lot of interest in CRISPR. It gets a lot yeah. of media coverage. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, CRISPR is right right there, uh, and it's uh, it, it's one of of many techniques that are that are right now. Uh, <laughs> It's very hard to to pick a side because uh, mm. a lot of the things that that are being developed, I mean, they're they're equally amazing. But oncology is not just developing upwards; it's developing this way. Mm, and it's, yeah, depending true. on which mm. which field you're on, uh, it's uh, I, I think what it's going to be that that wholeness that is going to to allow us to to reach new heights in oncology, not just one specific uh, part of uh, of these oncology developments. Um, uh, but I, I think it, we're still probably a bit of ways until we're able to incorporate all this new technology. And of course, uh, as time has shown us, uh, just when we're getting used to one new technology, another one comes up. Uh, and it's just like, you know, and it's trying to understand that, trying to see, okay, what can we do with this? How can we, how can we maximize it? And that's why we need, you know, just like we need oncologists, to, we, we need scientists, we need we need nurses. We, we need everyone to, to join this. Uh, this uh, I, I, I don't like the analogy of a of a fight, but uh, see, I, I think when it comes down to, to doctors, I mean, I, I actually feel like I am fighting with cancer daily, mm. not specific cancer, but cancer as a whole, and mm. because that that is the that is the goal that we have. And of course, like 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 everything in this world, you you have to have something, someone someone or something to fight against. And for me, it just happens to be cancer. Oh, and when, when it comes to targeted therapies, what do you think the biggest challenges are for clinicians at present? Um, you know, yeah. we've been trying to test it ourselves from Anguist's perspective, but we, we don't know how, what, what the challenges are and how to address them. Well, the challenges are that, I mean, we've, um, we've come up with ways, uh, we, uh, we've come up with ways to actually find alterations to find things that are wrong. The problem is that we don't have the tools to fight those things that are wrong. We just can tell you that there is the, <laughs> there's something wrong here. This shouldn't be like this, but we don't have drug yet. I think that, that that is the biggest thing is that it's, it can be uh, a bit overwhelming knowing that you, you have these, uh, you have these alterations, but you have absolutely no way to combat them. Uh, yeah. And I think that that's what I'm, I'm kind of being very hopeful is that in the in the future we will have uh, we'll we'll have therapies for these. Okay. So like more niche drugs for specific yeah. alterations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then of of course I mean we, we don't we don't right now everything has been I, I think oncology will eventually evolve. Uh, whereas we have been uh, separated by tumor groups for such a long time, having a, a better understanding of these targets will probably be blending in the treatments that we use for specific, for you know, not just for specific tumor groups, but more for actual mutations, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, it's a, it's going to, be a completely different uh, scenario than what we're experiencing now or that we have experienced traditionally okay mm. and final question gil and um, so all the editing and content creation of for uncle Alert is done by you how do you manage to you know in the time between uncle Alert practice and family you must have I, twin. <laughs> yeah no no uh, sadly no uh, i've tr looked into cloning and we're, we're another technique that we're not there yet uh, i uh, fortunately have to say that i have a very very understanding wife uh, that allows me to do all of this uh, to a certain degree <laughs> uh, i uh, yeah everything that that is done uh, i have my uncle alert time set aside and and she knows that uh, she knows she allows me to have that on all the time especially on the weekends uh, and of course it's something that you you give up uh, because you, being uh, having your family uh, you want to be there for them the whole time uh, but you also know that uh, well now i know that what i'm doing is actually proving a purpose just like when i 
when I show up to work every day, I know that whatever I'm showing up to make, to, to have an impact in somebody's life. And, and that, that is a very powerful thing. And that is something that keeps you happy, keeps you positive and keeps you wanting to come back. Well, it's the same thing with Hong Kong Alert because I know that this is not something that I do for the likes. It's not something that I do for the social media recognition or whatever it is. I do that because when we had normal meetings and I used to meet people normal, like walking down in the middle of ASMO, people would stop me and say, you know, it's really great what you're doing. Uh, we really, I really like this or uh, this educational uh, lecture was great. Well, now I have that same thing, except they send me messages. And, and that's mm. the coolest thing. I mean, that is the biggest form of flattery is for somebody telling you you're doing a good job, you know, especially if that person is coming from, from the, the like in this case, like the, the countries where I'm actually targeting these low and middle income countries, they're actually benefiting from it. This means that I'm actually getting through, I'm actually achieving my goal. And of course, when it comes down to our, our patient advocates, uh, when they say, oh, we really appreciate it, or when, they, when they're actually uh, when they say, well, I, I really liked uh, every, every initiative that we have, uh, we, we include our uh, patient advocacy voice. So whether it be the colloquium or the spotlight forum, uh, we include our, our patient advocates. Uh, and, and just to hear that, oh, I, I really like the fact that you're including our voices in there. I was like, well, of course we have to include you in there. They're, they're, it's the patients are the reason we do this. And mm. uh, so, so it's, it's obvious. But I, I guess it wasn't so often. So what, when you hear these things, it just makes you it makes you keep going. And it's a reason that I take time for my family. It's a reason that that my wife understands that this is important to me uh, because it is very fulfilling. Uh, the only thing that is frustrating is that I wish I could do more. I wish I could actually go to that next step. But I think for that next step to to happen, which I'm always asked about. I need to quit practicing medicine. And, and quite honestly, I am not ready to do that. Mm -hmm. this, this was supposed to be something I was doing for, because it, it made me feel good. Uh, but medicine is, is the reason that I, uh, yeah, okay, my family is the reason I live, but uh, medicine is, is also one of the, the big factors that of my, uh, my happiness. So I don't think I could, I could ever let that go. So I, I just have to make sure I, I can, I, I delegate and I use my time wisely. Of course, yeah. Well, you know, congratulations on what you've built. It's it's really amazing um, what you've done considering you're practicing full time and you've you've you're married and you've kids. It's it really is very impressive. Um, and thank you to your wife also for giving you that time. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin, and, and thank thank you so much, uh, especially uh, with everything that that you all are doing as well. Because I know that a, a lot of uh, the the people that are, I'm actually uh, trying to reach, they 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 use your app a lot, and, and, and they 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 tell me that, that this is something that's something because they they'll run uh, they'll run uh, they'll run into some of our, our videos in the app, and they'll tell us, oh yes, you know, oh, I didn't know you that you were there. Yes, no, we use this app daily. It's like oh, okay, well that's great. Uh, so okay. I think it's 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 a wonderful a wonderful way of uh, of helping of helping people and of course helping the the people that need it the most.